You thought you tricked me, didn't you? I tricked myself. I'm tired. All right. Anyways, hello, everyone. How are you? Thank you for joining us for our second talk today, as this is our third Sunday of the month. So we usually have a, for us, a morning talk. We call it our other talk, which we do, again, every third Sunday of each month. So that people who cannot join us now at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time at our usual weekly time can pop in and have some good times with us in person, so to speak. So that morning talk takes place at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time on the third Sundays of each month. So tonight we have sort of kind of a continuation of the discussion we began this morning. Uh, I guess I should do a very brief YouTube spiel. Yes, you should. So, uh, yeah. <sighs> Support us by doing so, by doing, liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing with your friends, sharing with your enemies, making fun of us on various platforms. Any of those things would be of great benefit to us as we seek to organically get ourselves out there into the world more. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to support our work in other ways, you can donate, you could buy a t-shirt, you could even have a one-on-one -on -one session with one of us or even awesome. both of us. And you can get further information on that by sending us an email or checking out our little blurb on the topic on Facebook in our Facebook forum, which you can join via a link in the description. All of the stuff you need to know is basically in the description. So with no further ado, have I left anything out? Um. I don't think so. No. Like this, subscribe to us, leave a comment about this video and all of our other videos, every single one of them. <laughs> yes. Even if you haven't is. watched it, it's okay. We don't mind. So getting to the topic at hand, this morning yeah. we discussed, um, what did we Objective discuss this magic. morning? Objective magic, which was a pretty massive topic. And tonight's topic is going to dovetail nicely with that. We kind of are talking about a lot of like seemingly weird esoteric stuff today. So this evening it has to happen from time to time. <laughs> I enjoy it. We're going to be talking about quote unquote higher being bodies. Kind of an interesting phrasing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it goes with the metaphor that was being used. The trouble is, is that back when they were talking about this, they thought that it was actually real. And it's not. You know, higher being bodies is some rare material accreting itself onto your body in a mysterious way so that you have a body inside your body and all of that. And it just ain't so. That's not what happens. People, some people have tried to change that and go, oh, it's all electrical. But that's also not so. Because if it were so, we would be able to see it using various instruments. But that's the way it works. You have to understand that since the beginning of time, people have tried to describe how things work. And they've done it with the tools that they're familiar with. Think back. We have Thag, the caveman, and his buddy Scraggle. And Thag is trying to explain to Scra Scraggle how language works. And he says, language is like this rock. I have a thought in my head and it comes out my mouth hole and it comes here and I throw it towards your ear and it hits you in your ear hole and that thought goes inside your head. <laughs> makes sense. Totally makes sense. Yes. Yeah. And if you look at the history of humans trying to explain stuff, that's pretty much what it's like. I mean, you're hitting us in our ear holes right now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> And to, to Thag and Scraggle, that made perfect sense because the rock was their primary tool. 
you know, it's like, Alexander Graham, whatever, uh, I forget who did did that, created the, the phonograph. And all of a sudden, the mind is like a phonograph. The, the little needle marks the grooves on your brain, and then it plays back, and you have memories. Y'all are too young to remember that. But that's okay. <laughs> um, and then it was like, the mind is like a calculator. Human beings are like calculators. You punch in the numbers and you get answers. And then you, that gives you numbers back and you keep doing that. Then it's the mind is like a computer. We try and create our minds in the world. And we describe what we're doing using the best metaphors we have. And in the 19th centuries and 18th century, the best metaphor we had in the West was higher being bodies. This idea that these very fine fluids were building up in us and creating new bodies for us that would exist after this body died. And that was a great metaphor 150 years ago because we didn't have anything better. That is not the metaphor that works for the 21st century. And today, we're going to talk about a metaphor that might work better for understanding what these higher being bodies are. Make sense so yeah. far? Everyone yeah. yeah. Haven't lost anyone. Nobody's fallen asleep. Uh, Halil. Yes. Yeah, one of the things that always stumped me when I was, you know, when I whenever I would get involved in a Gurdjieff group, one of the first questions is they would come and very seriously and and somberly say, "Are you are you starting to feel an energy? Are you starting to feel something vibrating?" And I never could figure it out, but I think that that's probably what they were getting at was was I starting to feel a higher being body, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah, Gurdjieff groups got weird questions because, first of all, Gurdjieff's English was for shit. And he was much more comfortable talking in Turkish or Russian. And so, because almost nobody around him spoke Turkish, he gave most of his talks in Russian back in the day. Um, like all of Ospensky's talks, all of the things that he recorded were originally in Russian and then translated into English. I've only ever met one person who read the, the Russian original of uh, Ospensky's meetings or in search of the miraculous. And he said it reads very, very differently than uh, the English version of it, mm. which I As, thought, yeah. Yeah, it's so often the case, right? Yeah, I've got the, I read the Russian version of a, Beelzebub's tales. I've got that. Oh, wow. Ah, that must be a brain twister. <laughs> it's actually much more comical in Russian than it is in English. A lot of the humor was lost in the English translation. Uh, mm -hmm. you, that you could really see the sly man coming out in, yeah. in, in Gurdjieff in the Russian translation or the yeah. Russian original. As Taryn says, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of got to be willing to learn Russian in order to really get the flavor of what was being said and uh, that's a whole world unto its own yep it's useful though everybody should speak more than one language mm. in my humble opinion yeah which is the only correct one <laughs> so we're always going to be in this bind of being limited to the metaphors that work for the time in which we are finding ourselves yeah and the metaphors for other times not working as well as they could yeah and we kind of have to be able to bracket it out in the sense of being able to put yourself in the shoes of people who were hearing that and what that may have meant to them at that time rather than so much what it means to us in our time so imagine if Plato were born in 
1989, would he have used the metaphor of the cave to describe what he was talking about? No, he wouldn't. He would have used something. He probably wouldn't have even used the movie theater. But take for, take a moment to imagine how Plato would have described the metaphor of the cave if he were a modern human with a completely different understanding, not necessarily a better understanding. Yeah, the matrix, exactly. Yeah, so I see Chris is unmuted. Did you have a thought? Yeah, just like when, when I first read that, uh, that allegory, I was like, thought it was so dumb, this whole thing of people putting stuff on their heads for the shadows and whatever. It just seemed really dumb. I didn't totally get it. And then when I understood that this is like showing a, a man-made, manufactured uh, illusion, then it uh, became more clear that uh, you could look at even social media being like the shadows on the wall. Yeah, as, a, as, a, as a for instance, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so de definitely. He couldn't have used that one. Yeah, he would have come up with something totally different, like Khalil said, uh, the Matrix or uh, a computer game. That's a common one these days. I mean, there's entire an entire genre of books written from the point of view of being stuck inside a computer game. Plato would have dug that. Tron, yes. So. Just as an aside, if you don't speak more than one language, and just about everybody here does, um, I highly recommend that uh, you take the time to learn one. Preferably a language that is not closely related to your milk tongue, your mother tongue which will be easy for Yusuf because Turkish isn't really related to anything. <laughs> Halil says Duolingo is a great, <clears throat> a great resource for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on, yeah. A free resource. Yeah. So a few others as well. Learn a European language, learn a Middle Eastern language, learn an African language. Let me tell you, when I learned Kiswahili, I understood things in a totally different way than English ever presented anything to me. Um, and learn an Asian language. The same was true for the studying Bahasa, Bahasa Indonesia, Indonesian language. Um, it gives you a radically different view of the world. Benjamin Worf was probably more or less right. Yes, Halu specifies the Worf's Sapir. Sapir hypothesis. I'm familiar with it. I just didn't know how to say "sapir." So thanks. All right. So anyway, we digress. Anyways, that back yeah. to higher being bodies. Back to higher being bodies. So let's assume that there is something that higher being bodies is talking about but they were talking about it in the same way as physicists talked about luminiferous ether and phlogiston back in the 19th century. Both were descriptions of how they thought things worked. Both were utterly wrong, but whole scientific bodies of knowledge were crafted around these two concepts that were utterly and totally incorrect, and yet they crafted sciences that sort of kind of worked, more or less. It's like the the, the Ptolemaic uh, vision of the solar system and the universe, where the, the, which was uh, 
not heliocentric. Ptolemy, yeah. In it, you know, the Earth being the yeah, center. Yeah, the, the Earth was the center of the solar system and the sun revolved around us. Yeah. Made for weird math. So that being said, they were still trying to describe something that was real. And they were trying to describe something that is not just important, but essential to the work. And we touched on it a little bit uh, this morning when we were talking about human one, two, and three and magnetic centers and things like that. Um, I'm going to use Gurdjieff's unwieldy terms because that just comes to my mind without me having to think about it. <laughs> but when I say man one, two, and three, I'm using the uh, the generic human one, two, and three. So I'm going to probably go between the two of them. I could say woman one, two, and three sometimes. <laughs> fun. Person one, two, and three. Sentient being one, two, and three. So everybody has, we assume, let's say four, the way I talk about it is neural circuits. And uh, various people have touched on it. This, this gets into fringe science, but it's built around the work of Conrad Lorenz. We're kind of pulling a whole bunch of models yeah. together to talk about this. So yeah. hold on to your hats, I guess. <laughs> uh, Lorentz was a scientist. He was a Nobel Prize winner, if I remember correctly, who wrote about uh, imprint vulnerability. And, you know, he noticed that Here's a newborn baby giraffe, plop. And its mother is, is almost immediately killed by a Jeep, but the Jeep stops because it didn't mean to kill the giraffe and it goes back and rescues the people in it, go back and rescue the baby. The giraffe imprints on the Jeep, thinks it's a Jeep, follows the Jeep around as if it were its mother. When it gets older, tries to mate with Jeeps. This is a this is an imprint. Now, we know that mammals have areas of imprint vulnerability. We know that birds have areas of imprint print vulnerability. Uh, because the same thing has happened with uh, a goose imprinting on a ping pong ball. And you get the same sort of reactions. I would submit to you that humans have areas of imprint vulnerability, and we have more of them than uh, a mammal would. And the way to look at that is to look at the structure of our brains and go, we have a lizard brain, we have a mammal brain, we have a primate brain, and we have a human brain. Who here knows their neuroanatomy? Who can tell me what those four parts are? Besides Noor. Anybody? Neocortex for the human brain? Yeah, the neocortex would be the human yeah. brain. What would be the lizard brain? Uh, the stem, the brain stem. Yeah, the limbic system. And, and the mammal is all the bits in between. I wish I could have said that more eloquently, but. Yeah, the, the mammal, uh, gen, general, generalized mammal brain is the cerebellum and the, uh, the beginning of gray matter, but also uh, more uh, 
advanced parts of the limbic system that control emotion. The monkey brain is the cortex. And the human brain is the neocortex. This is not true. None of this is true. It's just a way of talking about it that gives us a handle for it to understand. Are you all familiar with the phrase ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny? <laughs> no. I am not. What does that mean? Let's let's put that well, in let's, yeah. Yeah. Khalil had a question first. Yeah. No, I was just responding saying I know what that means. Okay, good. Tell us what that means. <laughs> um, it's it's the theory that was originally devised by Ernst Haeckel, who was one of Darwin's big followers. And he's actually, he was actually a great artist, too. And one of the things that he did in his schemata for um, what he, I think, mostly projected onto the way humans develop embryonically is that he showed the way that, and he kind of, he kind of fudged it, too, but basically the way that an embryo into a fetus repeats and recapitulates all the stages of evolution in its own development in the womb, in utero. Yeah. And it's sort of maybe kind of true. I mean, you start out as a single-celled organism. You become a multi-celled, undifferentiated organism. Then you start differentiating into something that is very fish-like and even has gills and a tail. You look a little bit like a seahorse. Finally, you get more mammal-like. And, and that's, that's the idea is that uh, the, the general evolution of the phylum is recapitulated within the individual. So this idea that you go up the up, up the evolutionary chain. That's that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah, and again, this isn't true. It's a model. It's a way of describing the phenomena. Yes, there was a time when you had gills. Did you know that everybody here had gills? That's what these mm -hmm. are. These started out as gills and now they're ears. Everybody had a tail. Some people are still born with tails. So, humans have basically four areas of imprint vulnerability, which would be the three bodies that we talk about, the three, man one, two, and three are covered by the first three areas of imprint vulnerability. The first area is the area of moving towards that which is good and nurturing and warm and cuddly and will feed you and moving away from anything that is noxious and threatening. We all see that in babies. And think about that as a horizontal plane. Move towards, move away from. Second area of imprint vulnerability, that, and that's man number one. Man number one is physical man, is uh, being in the body. Man number two is represented as emotional man, and that is um the way it's often described is as pack hierarchy and it's it's more literally uh who can you dominate in the environment and who can dominate you survival tactics yeah territory control Mind. Emotional manipulations, if need be, yeah. Especially emotional manipulation. I mean, what is a crying baby? Not one that's crying because they're hurt, but one that is crying because they want something other than somebody who is using emotional manipulation on you. Baby sits there and howls until it gets what it wants. And then it goes, oh, cool. 
<laughs> which is what it's supposed to do yeah it's, because it's that totally is its way to behavior for communicate a yeah now the third area of in imprint vulnerability has to do with the cortex and that has to do with language when we become speaking creatures we operate in a dimension that is different from the forward back and up and down we we have a third dimension that we get to play in or that is the third dimension forward back is the first right and left is the second and then up and down would be the third if you're going to be more accurate and we aren't going to be more accurate so forget that <laughs> um, yeah i've heard that um the safety and threat is forward back and dominant submission that's up and down and then intellectual is like right and left like manipulating objects in space and stuff like that yeah and it's interesting because this particular area of imprint vulnerability of, of patterning deals with language and it deals with fine motor skills. The ability to create a beautifully flaked stone point is related for uh, to the ability to get your mouth rocks into Thag's ear hole. <laughs> Sorry, Nor. <laughs> yep. So why is that? What is this linguistic connection? What do you mean what it is? So um, you were saying that. It's related to fine motor skills. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that they had to develop together. If you do, if you have language, you're going to look at the rock and go, hmm. I wonder what would happen if I hit this rock with that rock. You hit the rock with that rock and you discover something about it, which is if it's the right kind of rock, it creates a cutting edge. So you begin to uh, manipulate your thought environment as well as your world environment. You don't just chase down your prey and you know hope that you can kill it by poking it with sticks. You work out tactics. And this is the interesting part of the linguistic phase of development is that it becomes uh, time binding is the word that is often used you can use language as a representational system to project your behavior into the future and to share it with your friends so chris and Yusuf and I are out to get ourselves a tasty bison, right? If we are homo erectus, we grunt at each other. But if we are homo neanderthal or homo sapien, we can share complex ideas on how to sneak up on that sucker and bushwhack him while he ain't looking. And we can carry them out because we have plotted a future course which then can be adapted as we go. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Uh, Halim's good. And we're gonna get to higher being bodies in just a second. Okay. So the fourth level of this is cultural. Uh, it's actually sociosexual is what they call it, because 
an imprint in this area determines where you fit within your culture and what you're interested in sexually. So my father really enjoyed women wearing nylon stockings with seams up the back and tight skirts and cute pillbox hats. Think 1943 and what a woman looked like then or the 1930s, what a woman looked like then. I, on the other hand, have a thing for hippie chicks because that's where I came of the age when one imprints on that particular thing and that will stick for the rest of your life uh, barring shocking circumstance. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. And as much as people would like you to like you to believe that there is a, a common imprint that people should take and do take, it's not true. It's not even remotely true. So and what do you mean by that? Say more. Um, for instance, if you were a Christian, you think that things should be a particular way. Culture should be a particular way. People should be a particular way. And anything that is not that way is considered outside the norm. So if you are a Christian in this world today, you think, oh, hey, nuclear family, one man, one woman, two and a half kids, and a dog, right? And there is complete marital fidelity, and that's the only way it can be. If, on the other hand, you are a member of the Maasai culture, it could be one man and four or five women, and none of those women are going to be monogamous with you, nor are you going to be monogamous with them. Because that's how their culture works. And it works perfectly for them. It works as good as anything I've ever seen. There's a, when a Messiah man comes home, if there's a spear across his door, it means that his, his wife is entertaining someone and he just goes and hangs out somewhere he does not feel upset about this if he did feel upset about this culturally he would get made fun of this sometimes happens when an older gentleman gets a younger wife who came with a boyfriend and if he gets jealous of the boyfriend they make fun of him they literally tease him about his jealousy. And yet, Maasai culture is incredibly robust. It's one of the few cultures in East Africa that survived meeting the Brits. And the British are, are well known for destroying every culture they came into contact with. And they did not destroy the Maasai culture. Robust and resilient. Yes. And also mean as hell when they had to be. <laughs> so. so that goes to show that there is there is no one normal. There is no normal. Normal is whatever your group agrees is normal. And the group over the hill might not agree that that's normal. And sometimes wars are fought over this.
So this cultural idea is the balance point. These first four areas of imprint vulnerability are kind of automatic. They're going to happen to you barring unforeseen, unforeseen circumstances like a brain in, injury. And it will happen even with certain brain abnormalities. Um, I've worked with a number of Down syndrome kids and I've watched them all go through this, through each of these stages. It's different, but it's the same. But what if there were three more above this, the, the fourth one being the pivot point that could only be developed consciously. It only could be developed through will that do not naturally open. Back in the 60s, we sometimes got them accidentally opening, uh, mostly thanks to very interesting plants and fungi. but that's not considered the best way to do it. Which we discussed a little bit this morning as well. Yeah. So let us assume that there is, for lack of a better term, uh, something that is equivalent to the emotional center, something that is equivalent to uh, the intellectual center, but at a much more complex and refined uh, <coughs> level. And you can only get to it if... Um, you take that fourth center and consciously change it. So this is where we start talking about quote unquote, higher being bodies, huh? Yes. Yes. Yeah, what we've described up to this point is the standard issue being bodies. Each of these, the, these things that I call imprints uh, back in the day were considered bodies or part of the physical body and the emotional body and all of that and then we have all of this other stuff what we're talking about here is taking the uh the socio-sexual center and converting it into what these guys would have called the astral body or the Kedzjan body. Uh, or the magnetic center. So the astral body, that's, that's, that's an even more recent, but still kind of on the edge of being, uh, I guess it depends on what circles you move through, but yeah, the idea of an astral body goes back quite some ways. Yeah. But it was very popular amongst the theosophists and um, anthroposophists and all those peoples. Yeah. And all the old style, westical, mystical folks wanted to go astral projecting. Yes. So now that tends to be the domain of like New Agers and people in that milieu. Yes. So how do you do this? How do you begin to turn your cultural imprint into a higher order moving center? Because that's where 
it starts, right? That's where it starts. Any ideas? I mean, I can tell you my ideas, but you might have better ideas. Mm, Terrence, would you out. go for it? Self observation. Yes, self observation is a very important part of it and a particular kind of self observation. This would be self observation of the sensations given to you as a body. So here I am. I can feel my breath. I can feel my limbs. I can feel my skin. And that's a start. I can observe myself feeling all of these things. In order to make this transformation, it really helps to move. This is why in, say, if you're up in Wudong Mountain, you're going to be doing a very rarefied form of Tai Chi or Baguazhang or any number of other movement arts that are designed not just to be self-defense, but to connect you consciously with your movement. My first Tai Chi teacher gave me this exercise back when I was a young whippersnapper. He said, all right, dude, take your hand, put it here. Now put it here. Now put it back here. Now put it here. What do you notice? And I said, I notice my hand here. I notice my hand here. And he says, yes, exactly. If you were a Tai Chi master, you would have noticed every one of the infinite points between beginning and end. Your entire movement would be filled with your awareness. Most people, when they move, they're conscious at the initiating point and they're conscious at the end point, then they're asleep in the middle. So one of the tricks of developing the Kejdan body is to infuse your body with consciousness, which is gonna be rough in the beginning because a lot of us are very uncomfortable in our bodies. There is pain oftentimes, there is hurt. Noor is constantly in pain. Some days are better than others, but I, in all of the years that I've known her, I can't think of a single day where there wasn't an ouch involved. <laughs> That's how I would put it too. Yeah. There was an ouch. There yeah. was an ouch, yeah. Yep. But that's okay because that is also part of the awareness. It's educational. It's very educational. It gives me no choice but to have some degree of tuning in to my body. So when you look at, say, you go to uh, the old Persian Empire and you look at uh, what they do in the Zurkhane. Zurkhane means house of power, house of strength. And this is where you got all of these guys together and they're swinging the clubs over their heads and over their shoulders. And they're working on the push-up boards, uh, doing phenomenal different sorts of push-ups. They are using these gigantic wooden doors called sang, which means it's a kind of shield. Um, and um, a steel bow strung with chain that they're moving around, plus all sorts of just calisthenic-like movements. These are design, designed, yes, to make you strong, to make you limber, to make you uh, tough, and to make you a good fighter, because wrestling is also a part of the Zerhane. But more than that, it is designed to invite you into your body. It's not the only way to get there. I can see Khalil over there cringing right now. Don't <laughs> worry, nobody is going to ask you to do anything that hurts much. <laughs> uh, 
I don't mind paying. Just don't take away my pizza. That's all. <laughs> yeah, you can have your pizza, but it will all have pineapple on it. <laughs> you might be down for that. <laughs> Absolutely, that's even better. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the first step to creating, and all of these, if we speak in terms of bodies, they all must be created. If we speak in terms of imprint, vulnerability, they must be cultivated. And I think cultivating is a better word than creating. Because they're already there. Each of these next levels are already inside of you. You just do not have contact with them. And so just as the moving center has three parts, the uh, what would be called the magnetic center has three parts. One of which is the sociosexual part. That's the higher order of the, the sex part of the moving center. So that's like you're you're at the threshold of moving to the next. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the either realm innermost or, or outermost, depending on which way you want to think of it. Yeah. Then you have the moving part. The moving part is literally being able to sense your body as a living thing. This is why breath work is so important to us because the breath is, it's our control mechanism for our body. You can use your breath to change your heart rate, change your digestion, change all sorts of things, change your blood pressure. It's fun to practice this, but it's, it's indicative of a deeper thing. And the deeper thing is that there is a field of connection between body and being. And as that is cultivated, you create your, your Kejdan body, your astral body. It's not really a body. There is no accretion of fine materials somewhere inside of you. you know, nobody can do a, a, a surgery on you and find it. It's, it's not there in that sense. It's, it's just like to talk about it. Developing an awareness of yeah. what you say. It's, it's opening up a part of your neurology that you heretofore have not much used. And People now talk about brain-body connection. And even that is not accurate because it's not the brain and the body. The brain and the body are one. The brain infuses all of the muscles, all of the ligaments, all of the tendons, all of the viscera. It's all one thing. It's all connected. And part of our job, if we want higher consciousness, is to be conscious of all of that stuff. Because you can't separate them out. It no. doesn't work like yeah. that. Yeah. They are literally, literally one thing. Yeah. And this is, this is a, a holdover from our time as hunter-gatherers. We understood bodies as from the art of the knife, right? How do you know bodies? Uh, you, you have this eland, right? And you cut it apart. You separate it at the muscles and joints and you take it apart and you go, oh, this is like me. And you understand the body in parts. But now we have the skills to see the body as it really is or more as it really is. And uh, there, there is a uh, museum show that travels around the country, which is basically the visible body. They have all of these corpses that they have preserved in 
every different way. Yeah. One Body of, Worlds, is that what it's called? Something like that. Yeah, I don't remember. I remember seeing it and being yeah. in awe of what they had done because they, you walk up and you see a real human nervous system, right? You see all of the this room and stuff. But the thing that is most interesting is when they take the fascia and they remove the tissues from inside the fascia, but they leave the fascia there and they inflate it a little bit. What you realize is that you don't have separate muscles. You have one muscle throughout your body that is connected to uh, the bones in various interesting ways, attachment points. But it's like one bag of something, one bag of human. And it gives us a whole different way of thinking about ourselves. As a matter of fact, that was what allowed me to understand that the human body was a tensegrity structure. For those of you who are familiar with the work of Buckminster Fuller, the guy who invented the geodesic dome and the tensegrity structures that you see out in schools and dimaxion stuff, very cool things. Um, structures that are not pieces stacked upon each other but are integral parts um, mostly of compression and tension uh, sections so the bones would be your compression sections the muscles and more important the fascia is your um, your tension sections and they work together and your entire body responds to every stimuli so if somebody pushes my hand it isn't just my hand that moves but that moves from my arm this way through my body out the opposite foot and if you can learn to sense that you move completely differently this is a way of creating something that most people don't have most people do not have this and so they are unconscious in their body and you can see it in the way they move the few people who have this don't move like normal people an old friend of mine, I've actually been reviewing a bunch of his material, a guy by the name of Scott Sonnen. If you watch Scott walk, he's like a panther. He literally just kind of glides across the floor. He doesn't clump. And there is no part of him that resists any other part when he walks. And there are more and more people like that. Uh, Shuri. In in saying about the uh, cultivating the the movement, I think people need to understand that the fascia makes up more than half your mass because people tend to think of it as an inert substance, and it's not. It's highly innovated, and it has all your proprioceptions, so your sense of pain, pleasure, pressure and where you are in space. And so this material is like the glue that binds and wraps every muscle fiber to the next muscle fiber to make the muscle bundle, to actually blend into the bones and in all the nerve structures, the vascular system. So everything is inside this constantly changing uh, substance which has a contractile quality as well because it's it's not as fast as muscle but it has capacity to move and when people start actually realizing they're not stretching muscle but they're actually stretching the fascia they actually can find there's a different quality to that so when you're using breath to actually become more aware of your body if you put your hands on yourself whether you put it on the sides or in the front or the back and you're breathing and you're doing your practice that way you actually get 
the sense through your hands exactly how you're breathing. Are you breathing up here or are you breathing down in your belly? So if you want to build that awareness by actually feeling, 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 you can actually build it up faster because you, you become aware that this is not an inert substance. It's always giving you feedback, but it's in a whisper. So you're not hearing it as a shout or a stab of pain or something. So you think, what is that restriction in my shoulder that I can't rotate it forward or I can't rotate it back? Those sort of things are actually really useful if you want to build this body. Yeah, Sheree, by the way, is quite expert on this, considerably more than I am. So please feel free to chime in at any point when we're talking about this. So if you develop this, if you develop this magnetic center, this... Uh, Yes, Halima says Sheree has some great videos for this on her website too. Yeah, and even a couple in the Nine Sided Circle forum. My yeah. favorite, take it anywhere, even on airplanes, because it won't freak anybody out exercise. <laughs> so, uh, what's the name of your website, Sheree? I'm sorry for forgetting. SydneyStretchTherapy.com. There you go. Right. Use Sydney. my name. Lucito, and you'll find me. Yeah. All right. So onward, Mushtaq. Onward. So if you cultivate this correctly, then you have the possibility of creating the next body. Uh, and there's all sorts of different names for it. You know, people call it the soul body, the causal, causal body. Khalil, do you remember what Gurdjieff specifically ca called uh, man number five body? Or anyone, yeah, if yeah. you don't remember Khalil. No, I don't, actually. Oh. But I'll, yeah, if nobody remembers, I'll grab my book. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a book on higher being bodies, and some of the things you're saying today are blowing me away, actually. Good. That was our aim, is to, is to blow people away, because the old Gurdjieff metaphors for this don't work anymore they just don't work because we no longer think like a 19th century uh russian nobleman all right so maybe we don't remember the name of it off the top of our heads but the but... next yeah the next yeah. one coming up um we begin to crystallize that and that must be done consciously. And it's the higher emotional center, basically. The higher emotional center has, yeah, you know, the emotional center has to do with what we usually think of as emotions. The higher emotional center has to do with something very different. It has to do with conscience, first and foremost. It has to do with emotional connection to the self and the other. It, my teacher used to say that until you've activated this, you aren't really human. Uh, Gurdjieff used to talk about man in quotes. And he said, your job is to become man without quotes. And this is where you begin to become man without quotes or woman without quotes or human without quotes or whatever you want to think of yourself as without quotes. So that means you develop the power of conscience, which is a very high level of consciousness. So this is like applied empathy. Yeah, yeah applied empathy and understanding where your energy goes in the world and just as you learn to feel your body to develop the magnetic center you learn to actually feel emotional content and what you discover is that most of your emotional content is mechanical and it is held together by energy 
if you release the, the energy that is holding the mechanical pattern together, the energy is free. You still have it, but you can consciously shift it from the lower, the regular emotional center to the higher emotional center and use that energy clean of conditioning. This is when, you know, all of the, the holy guys talk about love, right? This is where you find objective love. That's another part of this center. Objective love is not, oh, you are so wonderful. It's, it is the resonant note that you strike with the world and with the uh, individuals, the consciousnesses within the world. And it's not soppy. Objective love is not soppy. Um, I've encountered grizzly bears occasionally in my lifetime. And I can remember the first time I loved a grizzly bear. I was amazed at it, the perfection of its being. And there was no part of me that wanted to go up and hug it, right? I understood that hugging that bear would bring into fruition certain mechanical aspects of bareness. And yet, uh, yeah, finish your thought and then I'll I'll read that. Yeah. Um and yet I could love the bear. I could be perfectly in tune with with the perfection of that of that grizzly bear as a living being. Um and still not want to hug it. I mean, yeah, St. Francis could have probably hugged the bear. Haji Bektash could have probably hugged the bear. But I'm not at that level. So uh, I, I do not fancy myself as bear food. Hmm. So there's something integrative about that. Like it's for me, I'm getting a sense of there being. Hmm. Hmm. How do I even put words to it, really? A sense that there is, oh, man, I think you described it so well that really it's just worth meditating on that than trying to put words to it. I, I, uh, plus, I'm tired, right? We were a bit through. Okay. Yeah, I figured you were just trying to <laughs> slide on out of that. <laughs> All right, Halil says, uh, Joseph Aziza says, uh, the harmonization of the higher emotional center with these, course, with these corresponds to the development of man number five and of the astral body. Harmonization of, harmonization of the higher emotional center with these. Yeah, it's basically what I'm trying to say, but in a very Gurdjieffian <laughs> way of saying it. Right. So we've gotten a taste of this higher emotional center slash being body um so as you said this this goes beyond just kind of reactive emotions this gets into sort of like responsive emotions in yeah. the sense of witnessing and corny words being present with yeah and the ability to entrain with your environment mm-hmm I guess that's kind of what I mean about integrating like there's this sense it's connectedness that goes beyond just like 
that thing and you. It's more of a in us, to put it one way. Yeah. So you all understand what entrainment is for for the Terrence. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Or I say, is that like implementing it with your day to day life? That you say, like moving. Yeah. Like being conscious. So it's like I'm able to be conscious and be aware somewhat of my movement like for example if it comes right here it's like okay i'm there and it's like a buffer when i move like when i move my hand like my mind just kind of goes somewhere else and then when it gets to the end it's like oh it's right there you kind of get what i'm saying so i'm still working on that and then while moving in society is more of a challenge so it's a practice to work yeah, yeah and imagine that with your environment. So you're sitting there with a friend and you get into this state and all of a sudden they're incorporated into your state. This is where magic begins to happen uh, because all of a sudden you communicate more deeply, you understand each other, uh, you connect with each other. Uh, because you have entrained with each other on a certain level. In a way, it's the same in the sense that you're not just queuing in on those yeah. end points between like one expression, then another, you know, discrete yeah, expression. Exactly right. Yeah. Just yeah. Adding a few more words. And all of those shifts in between become visible to you. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. that's what I was trying to that's well yeah. Yeah. And so it's like a real time experience as opposed to snapshot, snapshot, snapshot. Yeah, like snapshot glimpses of it. It's like in all from my memory, it's like I remember right here and right there. It's not like mm -hmm. how you said earlier where it's like a flicker of yeah. you know you being in it. Yeah. Right. Yes. And that goes not only for um, physical movement, but also for, you know, emotional engagement with another person. Having a conversation or witnessing each other move from one thought or emotion or you know the intersection of those two things from one moment to the next for me i get, with... I get that part it just the uh, going to sleep in and out so i gotta strengthen that because i'll be in there for a minute and then it's like whoa i was gonna sleep and then yeah. i just gotta catch myself and go back to it and that is the beginning of how it's done. Yeah. That's exactly where you start is catching those moments where you can see that you were asleep and bring yourself to awakening. Yeah, because before then, it was like I was lying to myself. I was going off of memory. Like, I remember going through all this and that. And I think my mind tricked myself where it's like I wasn't awake at all. Yeah. It's only been one snapshot. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We oftentimes just dream that we're awake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. so common in relationships where, you know, you adapt to someone, you think you know everything about them. So you just fall asleep in your interactions with them because you're just going on what you said, like memory, those snapshots. Oh, they're going to do this. They're going to do that. And there's no sense of active real-time experience of who they are and what's happening yeah that's true yeah. am i the only one who had that challenge i'm sorry what? parents i i would actually uh, the word that came to mind was how careless we are with our movement so we you know you don't even know that you've touched your face you don't know that you've um tossed your bag that you've thrown your clothes on and, and it's so 
grasping the intention of what you're doing with your movement and then when you're feeling the movement there is nothing else happening there's no story around the movement it's your feeling 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 and you're feeling the quality of it because then you notice that you're a little less careless and I think that with our modern culture and lifestyle draws us away from our bodies we're not aware of what we're feeling we're not aware if our clothes are too tight or if we're we don't know what true hunger is we don't know um when we should cease a particular activity but when you're actually always trying to be as intentional as possible not in a contrived way but your awareness of that that intention is less careless and then you'll actually feel that body. Gotcha. Question um, with the energy though, is this just a mind trick where when I first started doing it, it's like, I felt like my energy was depleted. Like it'd be a day I do it. And then the next day, like 80% of that day, I'm just sleep. That is a, a common phenomenon because in the beginning, you don't have much energy. Can okay. you think of a time where, uh, for whatever reason, you stopped getting exercise for a while, and then you yeah. started up again? Oh yeah, yeah. You know how sore you were? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly the same thing, only with your heart instead of your body. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. It's like a so, just throwing this word out now, literally, but it's like a muscle. Yeah. Really. Okay. All right. That's why I had that feeling in the beginning phase. I'm still in the beginning phase, but I feel it strengthening. Yeah. It's not and, like, yeah. And so every day that you can practice, it gets stronger. And those days where you don't have a lot of energy, you don't try and do a lot of practice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Force it. Yeah. If you force it, it would be exactly like, let's say you're working on doing barbell squats and you do a really hard day and the next day you're sore as hell and you go out and try and do the same number of squats at the same weight you're going to regret it yeah and that i had those incidents where that put me asleep for like a week straight yeah exactly wiped <laughs> out yeah yeah and it's like almost like a week and a half and it's like oh shit and then you, I just get right back to it. So you're right. The forcing part I learned from my mistakes off it. Yeah. Trust me. We've all done those mistakes in one way or the other. I, I, I could speak about it because I, I've probably done every stupid thing you can do when it comes to trying working on yourself. I've discovered yeah. stupid things that young people don't even realize exist. <laughs> So, yeah, this is, I mean, we're often using that, the metaphor of like the, the muscular sense of self, but, you know, if anyone's had like emotional overload, like they've just been totally wiped out in terms of, mm, I guess we could call it emotional burnout is a thing where you're just, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to witness anybody else's situations. I just want to retreat into myself and disappear for a while while I recover and rebuild my stamina to engage with others in a healthful way. That's, I mean, that's a thing too. <laughs> if we um, if if we talking about signs, I don't know, but uh, I'm a cancer. So I think what you just described, I'd be having periodically where it's like an overload and you, you don't want to even interact with nobody, but you got to go hibernation. Mm -hmm. And then you could go back being an extrovert or recharge kind of. So I think that's what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. yep. yeah. Self-care on the path is incredibly important and giving yourself recovery time is essential. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, yeah. The old Gurdjieff work was all about working yourself practically to death, and it demonstrably does not work that well. So, 
Um, yeah, super, super effort. Um, so it's how and, you, yeah. Yeah, the Gurdjieff understood super effort. None of his students did, as far as I'm concerned. And I only exactly. understand it because I had a teacher who understood it. Okay, that's good. Um, I got to go back to the readings with um, Gurdjieff, but I remember where it was one passage where they had that look in their face. Like they were forcing themselves to be present and mm -hmm. everywhere they have, like they had that look. I think Uspinski has said it in one of his books. And I, it kind of like put a vision in my head, like, is that like forcing it right there? Like going super effort with it, kind of? The, the wrong way? It was. It's like yeah. eyes bugging out and yeah, eyes bug, pulsating. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And dropping your eye eyelids open and all of that. And <laughs> yeah. There's a price that you pay for that. Yeah, that's life shortening yeah. rather than life giving, in my opinion. Yeah. And my teacher, he would have us do super efforts, but they weren't like that. My favorite super effort that he ever had us do was he decided that we needed a uh, a walkway from the back door of the Khanaga, the, the Sufi house, uh, out to the road. And so he called everybody together and he said, you, you, and you, go get a bag of concrete. Specifically, a bag of concrete. Gave them exactly the right money to get a bag of concrete. So we all went and got the bag of concrete, came back, mixed it up, put it out. He looked and said, okay, go get another bag. And we literally <laughs> did this entire walkway, one bag of concrete at a time. And the super effort had nothing to do with the physical. It had to do with the, wouldn't it be easier if we just got all the concrete at once, Sheikh? But we couldn't say that because you don't say that to your teacher. You, I mean, if, if he's a real teacher, you trust that he knows what the hell he's doing. And this taught us, uh, well, I can speak for myself in this, really taught me patience and taught me to get out of my own way in my own considerations and to just do the work. The work was not physically demanding, but it was emotionally and mentally demanding. And it made me confront all of these considerations I had about how it should be done in my head and let them go. And we ended up with a beautiful walkway and exactly the amount of concrete that we needed. Wow, that, that reminds me of the newer version of Karate Kid with your story where he took the jacket off on um, yeah. his master and he tell him to take it off and put it back on. And it was like a method to that madness, though. Like how you say you didn't want to question, you know, your, your teacher with it, but it was very beneficial because you was, is it like kind of you getting out your own way? Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly like, like that. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So do we have a, a third? Yes, we have the Higher Intellectual Center, which is the last one. Because it's it's interesting because we go one, two, three, four, and then we go one, two, three. Mm. Because four from the bottom is the, the fourth one from the bottom is the third one or the bottom of the next three, if that makes sense. Okay. So it's the foundation for the next the foundation three. Yeah. For the, yeah, for the next two or something like that. It all works out. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, we're doing our best with yeah, our limited that. energy, yeah, yeah, so. So the higher intellectual center has to do with symbols. It has to do with archetypes. It has to do with, uh, this is the part of you that will understand legomenisms not just experience them. Y'all know what a legomenism is, right? I think there's no harm in defining it once again. Okay, a legomenism uh -huh. is a work of art or science that carries within it a message that is conscious art, that is done intentionally. Um, some of the... Uh, great buildings of Egypt 
are like this. Uh, some of the uh, uh, the great artwork of Mesopotamia is like this. Some of the great artwork of uh, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance is like this. The earliest uh, earliest known legumenism, we don't understand it yet, but it's definitely one is in Turkey. Uh, it's called Gobekli Tepe. And that is something that was designed by people a very long time ago to carry forth a message into the future. And we don't know what the message is. It probably isn't we're all spacemen or anything like that, but it will it will say something about human consciousness. So there's something primal about this that yeah. goes kind of under the radar in terms of like, you know, communicating verbally about it. It's not so much about that. It's about something sensed or understood. Yeah. On a, a much deeper level than usually happens. Mm. You know, it, do you all have a favorite book that you've read 10, 15 times and one day you read it again and you see something that was you never realized was there and it was hidden there the whole time and you go, wow, and it changes the entire book for you? Mm. That's a legumenism. And you only get there once you have the foundation of your higher heart center open. The higher, the higher, the higher intellectual center cannot be built on a foundation of sand. It has to be built on a foundation of, of conscience. Cannot emphasize how important that is. So do things have to go in order like this, yeah, this uh, higher physical sense of self, this higher emotional sense to, of self? But you'll be sorry if they don't. Mm. It is it is well known that occasionally people will skip the whole magnetic center and start crystallizing the higher emotional center. <laughs> When this happens, it's usually a tragedy because if if you do that, you do not progress beyond it. You're stuck there. And the only way to get unstuck is to completely tear down your higher emotional center, go back and actually build your magnetic center and then rebuild the higher emotional center. And then you can carry on. So it is so, best to do it in order. It's like you have to relearn everything. Yeah, except that it's really painful. Mm. Every time you have to break something down and rebuild it, it's painful. Well, it's a loss, right? Of, of yeah. this thing that you've come to depend on, treasure perhaps yeah. made into part of yourself, and now you have to say goodbye to it. Yeah, and most people can't do it. Yeah. So very, you may as hard. well start from the bottom up, right? And and walk through each door yep. as you go. It's it's a good idea. <laughs> so what is it about this? this higher intellectual center that becomes special? Um, you get to have conversations with the universe and the universe talks back. <laughs> Spooky. But so, don't worry too much about that. <laughs> worry about creating your magnetic center. Because without that, the rest of it, it ain't going to come together. Y'all remember what I said about how to begin creating your magnetic center? 
I think it's important to review. Just let, just let us review or let us sum up. Mm, good. Sum up for us, Noor. Sum up, Noor. <sighs> Top of your head is very cute today. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, everything starts with breath, right? Yep. That may bore you all, but it is important. So what comes after that? Infusing your body with awareness. I mean, y'all have seen the Gurdjieff dances, right? Think if about- not, quick Google search, they'll pop up, I'm sure. Yeah, they just go to YouTube and they have some good examples. Those dances are designed to get your awareness into your body more than anything else. It's to break the habitual patterns where you can be asleep and put you in your body. I personally don't think that the traditional Gurdjieff dances are terribly effective anymore. I think that there are uh, more appropriate ways to address that for 21st century humans. And a number of them that are quite good. And I think we've addressed that in videos about the magnetic center specifically. Yeah. I'm going to have to find that video and put it at the end of this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there you have it. A quick overview of creating uh, higher being bodies and the step that you need to take to begin developing your magnetic center. As you do that, the centers below you are going to kick and scream. The centers below. Yeah, the, the, the moving center, the heart center, the head center. They're all going to kick and scream because they want all that energy. They're going to be like, what are you doing? No. Yes. No. And the thing that you have to realize is that the kicking and screaming is entirely mechanical. And you need to turn that into food for your magnetic center yeah so there's genuinely being depleted being like wow i need to go eat a sandwich and take a nap and not talk to people for two days and then there's the like making excuses or being like well you know i could watch this episode of blank instead of doing this thing that really speaks to me on a higher level that seems really important to me when I'm not getting caught up in my own bullshit. You need to be able to learn to distinguish between those two ways of getting caught up and tripped up. And that may be confusing and that takes time and it also takes maturity, which again develops over time and practice and applying the things that allow you to slow down and make those moment-to-moment -moment discernments without self-judgment. Sometimes you are being resistant to the things that you really care about because you really do need a nap. Then you take the nap, you wake up, and you go back to doing those things that matter to you. Yes, Terrence? Uh, I, I was agreeing with what you were saying about that because it was a lot of lying. I think like two years I've been going with this, but it'd be times where if I'm... Um, I'm at work and then I do my side business and I feel so depleted or so like, you know, tired. And then once I get back to the house and shower and all that, it's like, I'm still on YouTube or looking at a show kind of. So it took me a while to distinguish that, okay, I need to take a nap or I need to get some food 
or I'm just escaping from something kind of good. It was like three different categories of it, of what you were saying with me. And you have to be very honest. Like for me, I'm speaking for myself. I'd be honest because my mind just easily talks me out of it. But over the years, it's like improving though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I also find the more tired and depleted we allow ourselves to get, the harder it becomes to have that discernment. Because it's like all of those faculties just drift into uselessness. So with maturity comes this ability to catch yourself before you get to that point where you're like, oh man, I just spent like six hours wasting my time because I'm so tired from all this other important shit I'm doing. And now this cycle just deepens and deepens and deepens. But, you know, that's, it's all part of the learning process. And I think this is part of what Mushtaq you were talking about as well, where it's like, <laughs> young people are still learning all the ways that they can fuck up on this, right? Like all yeah. the ways that we can get squirrely and confuse ourselves and wear ourselves out. But eventually, if you're paying attention, you begin to learn. Yeah. I'm a great example of that. I have a, a vast experience in fucking up. <laughs> I am wending my way, but also benefiting from your wisdom and experience too. So it, it works both ways, you know? Hmm. Any other questions or thoughts? Lavita, you've been incredibly quiet tonight. Which is sad. I've been listening. <laughs> what do you think? Presence is exhausting. Yes. Until you get used to it. It's true. You got to yeah. up your presence muscles. Yeah. I, I was thinking the clearest analogy I could think of to it is if you drive or you commute without driving to work, you get in your car, you pull out your driveway, and then you're at work. Yep. <laughs> or you get on the bus and then you realize, oh, I'm putting the key in the door at work. And then other days, it's like you remember somebody sat next to you. Or like other things trigger your awareness, like somebody's wearing a fragrance you like or dislike, or, or there's an argument or an interesting conversation. So a lot of our attention is external as opposed to triggered internally. Like us actually being present versus something's going, hey, hey, hey. Mm. Yeah. And that's a, that's a perfect example. I mean, I, well, I, don't hardly do it as much anymore, not since COVID, but I used to ride BART and Caltrain all the time. And our local uh, bus and train yeah. lines. Yeah, our train lines. And almost everybody was totally zombied out. And I personally enjoyed paying attention, you know, paying attention to the ride, noticing the people. Noticing the people is sometimes important because especially on BART, you get some crazy ones. Uh, New York City girl here. I know yeah. you mean. Yeah, you know of what I speak then. Uh, yeah. The, the other thing that's kind of an enemy of presence is when you are present, you're a threat to other people. Yes. And And I can't tell you the amount of trouble I've gotten in over the years because I was present when someone was talking to me and they told me stuff that they, I guess, didn't mean to tell me. And when I referenced it later, they're looking at me like, how did you know that? Because <laughs> I'm an idiot. I went, because you told me when I really should have said, because I'm psychic. <laughs> Terrence, yeah, do you have a response to that? Oh yeah, it's a challenge. Just like you gotta, I call it not call it playing dumb, because um, from her experience, I like 
read about it and seen about it. And yeah, you're right. I'd definitely want the psychic pain. Or I'd have been like, oh, I'm just crazy. I don't know what's going on because that is complicated. But this reminds me of the poem I read. It's called The Hole in My Sidewalk. I think her name is Portia. Oh, uh, yes. It's it reminds me of that. I don't I gotta go look it up, but it's like she you you know the poem though, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you'd be able to explain it better than I can. Though, no, I couldn't. That. No, I couldn't. <laughs> you that means you're going to have to come and join us again after you have looked at that poem so you can explain it because you're gonna tell it better than I can. <laughs> okay, absolutely. And, and that is how Mushtaq sucks you in. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Good job. I only uh, showed up here one time, okay, three years ago, and I haven't been able to get out. No, you're not allowed to get out. <laughs> yeah, we like to we keep the ones we like. Yeah. Yep. That's good. So this um every every week or every three weeks. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a Sunday evening, well, for us, Sunday evening talk every week. Yeah. What <laughs> part of any world are you in? Circumstances. I'm in Florida. 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 Okay, so you're three hours ahead of us. So it's yes. right there. Yep. Because I usually watch it, like, my life is like a scramble, but I feel at ease, though, because I schedule. But when I'm doing my landscaping business, I like watch y'all and listen to y'all. And I remember Nancy though, because it was a live y'all did call. First you did self-observation and self-remembering, but you was definitely going in on self-observation. And <laughs> Miss Nancy was getting it too. Yeah. And I just remember that. And I, just, I downloaded it on YouTube, but I had to keep going to that live and a few others to reference though. But I'm glad I made this one though. I'm glad Us you too. It. Yeah. It's been lovely having you. And I hope that you will consider coming back. We'll lay a place for you at the table. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's great. Appreciate it. Yeah. And Sherry, her website was, uh, was it Sydney Stretch Therapy? That's it. Okay. Got it. That's Just it. make sure. As in Sydney, Australia, which is why she has such a weird accent. <laughs> We're okay. making you famous, Sherry. <laughs> So, not that you need any help because you're amazing at what you do just saying all right um who have maybe not heard from i um nancy yes yeah yeah just a couple odds and ends um i remember an alexander teacher talking about being aware of the space around you so it's not just the immediate sensations but it's in some sense how you imagine the space around you and I'd say within you makes a difference. Yeah, that goes to our void exercise that we haven't talked about in a while. Mm -hmm. We have to nag people about that one. Yeah, void exercise. Void Thanks, exercise. Nancy. Yeah, <sighs> that's after you can put yourself in your body, filling the space around you becomes the next important thing. So your Alexander teacher is dead on yeah i'm not sure quite what he was doing there i suspect he was trying to talk about the astral body in a way that was comfortable for materialists <laughs> that's fair hmm thanks nancy welcome uh how about you yusuf do you have any thoughts you might like to share? Um, lots of things to digest. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's totally fine. It is a lot. Yeah. How about you, James? Well, just as Yusuf said, lots of things to digest. That's exactly what I was thinking. I just got to <laughs> digest all this. But um, uh, to the extent I comprehend it, I agree with it. I, I like the sound of what I'm hearing, okay? It seems sensible. It seems balanced. It seems encouraging. It, it also seems realistic and feasible. It doesn't seem to be unrealistic. Uh, 
it, it accords with my own biases, so therefore it must be right. <laughs> Absolutely. If you agree with us, then we're we're we got it. <laughs> but the fact that it seems reasonable is what we're going for, because yeah. I want to do away with the esoteric bullshit. It's not useful. It is confusing, and people look at you like you're crazy. What's... And people already look at me like I'm crazy. So <laughs> more of that. Well, what I was going to say is, I actually think it's it's sad that people think that allowing something to be accessible and reasonable and sensible somehow sucks the beauty out of it or the the specialness out of it. Because I don't think that's true. I think that something doesn't need to be inaccessible to be wonderful and quote unquote magical and remarkable. There's it's... only a couple of reasons to hide things. The first is for self-protection. And that's a that is a viable reason. Yeah. Sometimes if you're in the wrong place doing the wrong thing, you can't let the man see you do it. Right? And so. I certainly don't disagree with that. But when it comes to gatekeeping for the sake of gatekeeping. Yeah, that's the other reason. Because yeah. if you don't, it will upset your rice bowl. You know that phrase, upsetting the rice bowl? No. It means that people think that they can get paid for doing this, and oftentimes they can. And so they want to keep things secret, so you have to come to, come to them and support them uh, in order to, to be given little tastes of the mystery. And I think that this is, it is wrong use of energy. Mm. Did you have a thought on that, Levita? Uh, I did, and 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 then something else happened. So now, no, <laughs> I don't have a thought on what because I agree with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we piss people off all the time because uh, we just give this stuff away. Yeah. I and... mean, we'll let you give us money. But we will we are, yeah yeah we are not getting rich because we are not exploiting our knowledge you know like we i guess could do that on some level and we don't yeah well if we did we still have to look at ourselves in the mirror in the morning well we wouldn't be doing what we talk about right yeah so and if i couldn't look at myself in the mirror i'd be like cutting parts of my beard off and stuff <laughs> you'd have to ask me for help yeah yeah uh chris do you have any thoughts you might like to add uh no just more breath practice more push-ups <laughs> well on that note um yeah i, I still got 30 to do so oh man i cheer you on did you I see you're still unmuted, Levita. Did you have something else you wanted to say? Yeah, I had a question. I'm hoping that this is not going to create an information dump, but <laughs> I'll take my chances because it's the end. It's the end of the call. But you know, one of the things I was thinking of as you were explaining Mushtaq was a whole lot of this stuff I've heard before, and that's not a oh I've heard it before. It's more like I've heard that before. Why didn't I remember that when I was in the moment? And I'm wondering how much forgetting is parallel or diametrically opposed to awareness. Like I'm thinking it's not necessarily the opposite side of the coin, but it's not really parallel either. So I wasn't certain how, where it sits, where those two sit in relationship. Forgetting is what the machine does. That's what it's all about for your mechanical nature is to forget everything. That's why you can drive to work and not remember what you did in between. 
when you can remember you have been conscious. The more awake you are, the more free you are from robotic uh, program behaviors, uh, the more you remember and the more deeply you remember. So in all likelihood, you were not at a point where you could hear this stuff. And so your mind just went, no, shut off. Don't listen. Forget about it. Put it away. And now you are. Either that or whoever told you wasn't telling you in a way that you understood. Well, it's one of those things where it's like, I'll hear it. I can acknowledge, yes, that makes sense, right? It makes sense. It it aligns with stuff that I didn't understand before, like, ah, oh, the penny dropped. And then it'll stay for a while. Some things have lasted. And in other things, it's like, I heard that 25 years ago. Why didn't I remember that? You know? And like you say, maybe I just wasn't ready to remember it. Yeah, that's a possibility. You know, but I'll admit that there's a whole lot of stuff that I learned here in the past three years that I wish I had remembered from 30 years ago because life would have been different. I'd be bu I'd be busy um, levitating now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can look forward to levitating next week. Yep. I mean, as oh. Hulu said, maybe we'll just like go deeper and deeper into the esoteric unitor unicorn shit and just you never know it's coming around the corner <laughs> hey truer words were never spoken <laughs> you know uh, it's bad you know it's bad when people say ah it turns out the government was hiding stuff from us aliens are real and everybody's like, uh -huh. when is my check due <laughs> yeah. nobody paid this mind everybody's like mm, okay whatever so I think the aliens came and went. <laughs> no, they're not ready. <laughs> no. We'll come back in 100 years. <laughs> yeah. If aliens come to this planet, it is to visit the zoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or um the circus. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. I, depending on where you look, it's more like a circus. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. One last thought from Sheree, and then we will wrap up for this evening. Yeah. Okay, this is for free. If you want to start moving, every time you eat, sit on the floor. Ah, uh, yes. That's the one where your body will tell you how uncomfortable it is and you'll move. And there's your movement. So, <laughs> Are, are you going to come pick me up? <laughs> <laughs> you have to drag trapeze network in there. <laughs> Off the floor. But you start off with using your hands to get yourself down and then get yourself back up. And then you start using one hand and then you don't use your hands at all. And you just find, oh, I can squat. I can get up and down. And it takes time, but you must do it for every time you eat food so that you get that practice in. Because people will find, I'm so busy. I can't do this. I can't fit in flexibility training. I can't do my push-ups. So the, every excuse under the sun will be that robot just trying to disrupt your practice. So one of the things to get into movement is just go down to the floor the lower you can get down onto the floor because some people started elevating themselves on benches so that they could sit on a bench cross-legged or folded leg okay now go to the floor because then getting up it, it's a really good exercise for you to get your movement in all right That's the freebie thanks Shri. speaking of eating on the floor <sighs> Yes, how about eating? Eating generally. I'm very interested in that right now. <laughs> All, right. All right. Brady Bunch mode. I didn't get to do this earlier. Brady Bunch mode. We are in Brady Bunch mode. Awesome. Okay. So we can wave to each other and wave to everybody watching on the replay. And thanks for hanging in there for like almost two damn hours. And we will see you next week at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. Take care, everybody. Be there, be square. Bye. Yes, thank you.